everybody. It's Brandon Gengelbach. Welcome to Leaders Online, our virtual learning series um, on Thursday today. Uh, we're going to be talking about HR compliance, setting expectations and standards. Um, so we're excited that you're here with us today. Um, at this session, we're going to talk about HR policies that are in place with COVID-19 and an update on some of the FFCRA regulations. Um, we're also going to talk about expectations to communicate to your team, to your employees regarding new standards um, and how we see the pandemic changing um, HR rules uh, moving forward. So um, we've, we've got a panel of amazing experts um, here in uh, the Fort Worth area that we're going to be chatting with. First is Jennifer Reed. Uh, Jennifer has 15 years of experience in employee benefits and HR technology. She started her career at Cigna healthcare and later um, in her career, she consulted with over 600 employee, employers nationally on their HR technology strategy. Additionally, she was a key contributor to the research and development of the ACA reporting services for, national HR payroll, for a national HR payroll provider. Uh, due to her unique background, Jennifer is known as a key presenter on ACA reporting. Uh, Jennifer joined Gus Bates Insurance and Investments to lead the compliance and HR technology consulting practice in June 2016. So Jen, we're pumped to have you with us today. Uh, also, um, we've got Mike uh, Coffey, who's going to be um, joining us. He uh, apparently may, may uh, have accidentally logged out, so we'll try to see if we can get him back. Um, <coughs> Mike is an entrepreneur human resource professional and licensed private investigator uh, and HR consultant. So that's a great, a great uh, combination there. In 1999, he created Imperative to bring high quality, high tech and high touch uh, to the background screening market. Today, Imperative serves hundreds of businesses around the US and through its PFC caregiver, caregiver screening brand, um, many more private estates, family offices, and personal service agencies. And just like that, Mike has changed settings. I think we had some battery issues and you're back um, right as I'm introducing y'all. So uh, Jen, Mike, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, and Jen, I think you're gonna start with some uh, crystal ball. Uh, and uh, as always for our, our, um, our viewers, if you have any questions, use the Q&A box and uh, we'll make sure to get those questions answered that you have today. So thanks again for being here. Jen, take it away. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate the, um, the invite for, to, for me to come speak today to the chamber. Um, I'm just gonna start off quickly just talking about crystal ball predictions to set the stage as far as what we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, we at Gus Space Insurance have clients that range everywhere from two all the way up to 10,000 employees. But a big block of our business is that small employer group market, which is what we're focusing on. Um, and so we have a lot of interaction, you know, with employers that are less than 50, less than 500 that are dealing with a lot of these regulations and changes that are moving forward. Um, the way small employers kind of always functioned in the past, I'm sure it's not new to you. That we love about the small employers. In fact, we at Gus Bates function a lot like that. You know, we function like a family. Um, some of the predictions I think that are going to happen as a, as a result of this COVID-19 um, pandemic um, will, may change that environment a little bit. Not that it's bad, it just it will be different and we'll have to get used to it. Um, one prediction that we have is that there'll be more official processes in place. Um, you know, smaller employers, especially less than 50, are being tackled with laws that affect them now, like the FSCRA guidance. Um, they have remote employees they're having to manage that they're not used to, um, as well as the CDC guidelines that are coming out for employers, you know, if you have an employee that's positive, um, and changing. Um, typically dealt with as heavily as it will be, so there's going to probably be more heavy official processes um, in the small employers and even policies. Um, I think they'll, as a result, hire HR in-house or at least HR consultants a little quicker than they probably would have prior to this. Um, and even maybe automate HR technology, not just talking about um, HR payroll systems, which is what I consult on, um, you know, just to be able to get payroll on the run, not having
really to put that base to where, like, if you have a bunch of remote employees, you can kind of see, control what they're doing or see what they're doing from that perspective. Um, and so I really, that's, that's some of our predictions. Um, so, Mike, um, hopefully we can hear you if you want to start, if you want to talk a little bit about the remote employee piece. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. It turns out that there were three different Zoom meetings going on in my house at the same time, and we were all fighting over uh, the uh, <laughs> remote access and, so, and the bandwidth. And so I've got a, a 20-year-old son who's, or an 18-year-old son who's uh, who studies at the Royal Ballet School in London, and he's doing classes in there from from London, and I've got an engineering student upstairs doing class. So everything started at two. But that's going to be one of the things that happens when we have remote employees, right? It's uh, there's going to be we're going to be having employees who are relying on their home infrastructures uh, to support enterprise grade uh, work and technology. And that's going to be something that we're going to have to plan for. Um, a lot of employers are even already having conversations about, well, if our employees are using their personal cell phones, their personal computers, their personal Internet, what's our obligation as the employer to help? cover those costs and how do we do that in a way that's not taxable to the employee uh, is it, you know and so we, you know employers are looking at those kind of issues um, the bigger issue that a lot of employers and the reason there was so much resistance for so long about taking employees um, remote was how do I manage their productivity how do I manage them as uh, you know uh, as employees how do I give them feedback and well the reality is <sighs> we found in the last two months that it's just like you would if you were dealing with them on a um, on an in-person basis if you're really you know if you're managing your employees right you've got clear expectations of what their performance is supposed to be and what they're supposed to do they understand the policies you've communicated to them clearly what you need them to do to, to be successful in the role and you've got measurements everybody should have numbers right everybody should have Something that says, hey, they're, they're meeting what our expectations or this is where they need to improve and we should be able to measure that. And so I think there's, when we're managing in-person workforces, it's easy to avoid doing good management and just try to do management by walking around and just spotting problems and, and dealing with um, oh, evidence or uh, uh, symptoms rather than dealing with actual performance and things that would really make help somebody be a really successful employee. And so I think making sure your systems around employee engagement, how you measure people, how you um, motivate them and all that shouldn't really conceptually be that different than what we do when we're dealing with employees in person. Um, we just need better managers and you really need to train your managers that it's important to stay in contact, have kind of consistent communication and maintain that engagement with employees. Because the one thing that's going to happen is it's going to be a lot easier for an employee who you don't see face to face on an ongoing basis to become disengaged. And especially right now, they've got, you know, there's so much uncertainty out there just in the air. And even if they've got a job that they're not really worried about losing, they've got friends, they've got family members who are, are struggling financially or having other challenges. And it's just the zeitgeist right now is just kind of awful. It's just kind of that feeling in the air. And so as employers, a big part of our job should be um, to be encouragers, to help em employees keep a clear head about what's, what the, the challenges is that we're all facing and know that there's going to be a tomorrow and that they, we're going to come out of this positively. Um, so those are the kind of things I think that'll make somebody successful. I think we're going to have some employees who say, you know what, I loved working at home and I was a lot more engaged and productive because I didn't have the water cooler chit chat and the people stopping by my office or my desk and, and, and just, you know, BSing around. I didn't have, I could get so much work done. And I've heard that from some employees. And then I've heard employees who basically like me, real extroverts who thrive on on the conversation and the creativity around talking to other people and all that. And I need those people. But I have learned even for myself in the last few weeks that when I really need to knuckle down and get work done, my bedroom upstairs seems to be the best place versus going to the office and, and, and I can get a lot more done if I've really got to uh, do that. So I think employers 
to be competitive as far as how we attract and retain the kind of talent we need. We're, the horse is out of the barn now, right? We've these employees who we're trying to recruit and keep, they've tasted it. They know what it's like. And some of them are going to want to be in a workplace, uh, in an office environment. And some of them are going to really want to work home for at least two or three days a week or something like that. So I think there's a lot of flexibility to be competitive that we're going to have to find as employers. And, uh, and really, we need to come up with those policies and think through that before our employees or our candidates are asking for it. So we know how far we can go in, uh, in doing that in a certain environment. Because I don't think we're ready for, uh, you know, to go to go to the bank and see a teller via Zoom. I don't think that's going to work. But I think there are a lot of positions that we probably have learned in the last few weeks we can actually do that. But that's going to mean having uh, a security infrastructure uh, and a workplace infrastructure that's that's going to protect the employees and protect the company, especially like when we're talking about security policies. Um, I'm working with a, a group of CIOs right now to kind of put some of those ideas together about what an ongoing, if this is becomes the new normal, and a lot of employees are working remote, what does that security look like? Because you definitely don't want, on an ongoing basis, your employees using the same computer that their kids are playing games on and downloading who knows what and all of that. And a lot of employers are doing that right now. They're using employees' personal laptops and things like that. So you're gonna have to come up with that security infrastructure. And then you gotta find a way to maintain that and enforce it because a lot of our most of our employees are great but there's a few knuckleheads out there who are going to do what's convenient uh rather than what you really want them to do sometimes and so you're gonna have to come up with that those policies and ways to monitor that that's where your it team and i think as we start to go back to work i think bringing back your hr and your it teams are the two that you really need to have hands on figuring out how to how to do those things because you've got issues like uh, personally identifiable information. I don't want that on people's personal computers. And I don't want, you know, if their home computer goes out and they, their, their kid has to get a project done that night and needs to get on the internet, I want to, I want a way to keep that kid from using the company laptop uh, or the company uh, computers or whatever we've got if they're installed at someone's home for their own projects, even if it's an emergency. It's just from a security and, and PII protection, it's just important. Another big issue employers are gonna have with remote employees is the Fair Labor Standards Act issues. Uh, if your employees are salaried, it's not such a, you know, they're exempt, it's not such a big deal as far as tracking when they work. Cause you can just say, did the job get done or didn't the job get done? And that's, that's pretty good as long as they're available when you need them. But your hourly employees, who more and more of them over the last few weeks have been working remote, you're responsible for the time they spend at you know working. If they work five minutes uh, answering a, a, and jump on on their local com computer and, and answer emails or stuff, you've got to com compensate them for for that. And so, how are you going to track those kind of things? Because it's hard for some people to turn off the workday. So they may work six or eight, nine hours during the day. And then uh, later on in the evening after dinner, well, I've got the computer here and I've already seen uh, Tiger King three times. So I'll uh, go on and uh, watch, uh, I'll go jump on the computer and knock out a couple of things. And next thing you know, you, owe this, uh, you may owe this employee, you know, eight or 10 hours of overtime this week. And if you haven't had a conversation with them about Hey, I need you to work the scheduled hours. If the work will get done, you don't have to do this other work. Uh, you could end up, and that's treble damages. If you don't pay overtime correctly, that's, that, that can get real expensive for an employer. And of course, your employees are always saying, oh, we don't mind. We're glad to do it, blah, blah, blah. And that works until it doesn't work. And until that employee, for some reason, thinks they've been slighted or they're unhappy, that's when they start remembering all these things that you may have told them, hey, I need you to do this, and they didn't do it. And now they're going to... Hey, Mike, I think you accidentally muted yourself, buddy. You were... Well, I sound better that way. Uh, <laughs> I sound a lot smarter, I can tell you that. <laughs> but if you're working from home and we've got uh, employers have a responsibility for providing a safe workplace for their employees. And just because you're at home doesn't mean you're safe. And so uh, a lot of large employers who have a lot of remote employees already have guidelines for what ergonomics look like for a home employee. And I know of one employer who actually 
sends people on site to the, the remote employees workplace where they're, they're, they're designated area for work and make sure that it's ergonomically correct. Because let's be honest, we really don't want that employee sitting on an exercise ball at their coffee table doing work and then falling over sideways and banging their head because I, you know, maybe your, in, your workers comp carrier would cover it, maybe not. You're going to be on the hook and it's going to be a hassle. So making sure that their, their workplace is safe and uh, ergonomically correct is going to be an issue too. Uh, when we're talking about remote employees, I know the FFCRA kicks in and Jen, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, be happy to. So we've been receiving, you know, waves of questions from our clients. Oh, it shows I'm muted. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, um, we've been see seeing waves of our questions from our clients, um, depending on the topic. And of course, FFCRA is, is one big one. Um, hopefully everybody on the phone knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> we're talking about FFCRA, it's those new paid leave laws um, that were effective April 1 for employers that have less than 500 employees. Um, one thing that's positive about the remote workforce um, is the DOL updated the laws to reflect that if someone can work remote, even if they're quarantined, um, even if they're potentially showing symptoms that they wanna work remote, that it can actually, you're not required as an employer to pay those. It doesn't mean you, you can say no, I would never say that. I'm saying that it gives other options. Um, you could have a, an employee that's quarantined by a doctor just because they had exposure to a spouse or a spouse that's high risk um, and still be perfectly able to function working from home. Um, so that's another piece that we get a lot of questions on. You know, are our employees exempt because they can work at home, uh, which is not the case, um, but it does give you a lot more flexibility of an employer in that area as a result. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about too is just quickly about what time and attendance systems actually do in that area because Mike's talking about a different level of IT um, and the payroll time and attendance systems, a lot of small employers don't have those. So I thought it might help just to kind of hear what they can do. Um, it's more for just clocking in, clocking out. It can also track, you know, the FSCRA time and tie it to payroll from a tax perspective, but it's not going to track if your employee's working. Um, or when they're at their desk necessarily. And so it's more just a, a record for that sake. There's a lot of things they can do, and a lot of vendors are kind of expanding in that space um, as far as incorporating, you know, social um, products into their HR payroll system that provide, you know, places employees can talk and coordinate. They're, they're more moving towards that for those type of employees. Uh, but on the time and attendance piece, I just wanted to be clear as far as what it could do. Um, you can see where they clock in if you if you do a what's it called a geofence or um, geolocation, um, even if they're clocking in from their phone, which is nice. Um, some will even take pictures, you know, if, if you don't want their spouse clocking in for them. <laughs> um, but it's not the level of, um, you know, tracking as far as if they're actually sitting working. Um, and I'd, say, I'd like to add a little the, another perspective to this too. Um, just before we move to the next topic. Um, and so I spoke to who I consider two really good managers. Uh, one that's a newer manager, that's our manager at GuestBase, our president at GuestBase, is now managing remote employees because we've all been remote um, and we're about to have kind of staff that split some remote and in the office. And then one, a past manager of mine um, that worked in an HR payroll company that has done worked with remote employees probably 20 years. And so I thought it would he it would be nice to hear from those two perspectives as far as how, if they're successful. Um, the one that had done it for 20 years, um, he gave me some text to share that might help. And it's more on the engagement side, motivating side, rather than, um, um, uh, you know, tracking or, or, or policing their situation, you know, to make sure they're doing what they're going to do. Um, and so some of the tips that he gave me as, and this is, I thought it was great because I've seen it, I saw it many times when I worked for him, um, but I never heard it as a strategy. Um, one of the things that he does, he automatically would give short-term goals every week um, that would come to you, you would deliver a report to the manager, say on Friday, um, and Monday morning there was always a call with the team. Um, back then the team was like 15 or 20 employees, um, but he would make it light and fun. I mean, even the report itself, he named it after um, like, the the show Office Space, <laughs> he named it that, so he'd, he'd make it light and fun, and he'd always start the meeting with something, meeting with something really light. Um, but but what he called the whole process that he did, and he had long-term goals as well, um, is he said that 
he learned a long time ago when he was a green manager when he first started. You know, when you're first starting managing, you feel like you have to make all these rules. You have to keep employees in line to make a mark to show that you know what you're supposed to. Now, fast forward to today when he's a senior manager, he says, you know, if you do it right, employees will actually manage themselves, uh, which is less stress on you as a manager and it's, it's more valuable. So what he creates is a natural peer pressure environment. So when you have everyone on a phone call remote um, every morning um, that morning and they've turned in their report as far as what their short-term goals are, the team itself, the ones that have succeeded, you're celebrating those and the ones that hadn't succeeded, they're actually um, naturally kind of being pointed out. And so the ones that are not being as active competitively want to be at the same level as the others. And so it's created a natural peer pressure environment, which I thought was really interesting. Um, on the remote employees that are more like the process oriented um, operational, you know, you can put, um, I think what Mike mentioned, you know, something behind the scenes where you can tell, you know, how much they're on if they're remote, if they're connected to your server, but it's not something that you, you want to make sure, you know, especially in the environment today, that it's a for sure 40. You know, we probably have to be a lot more flexible as, as employers um, with what's going on. Um, if someone's at home with their children and their kid, little ones are home, their work hours may not be the 8 to 5 anymore. They may be working late at night when the kids are asleep or during nap time. Uh, and so more flexible, and as long as they're not, they don't necessarily have to work the 40 as long as they're hitting their goals and the clients are happy. And so a measurement could be something a little different rather than just your hard time some, sometimes uh, when you're talking about if they're being successful. Um, and Matt, um, our boss, um, you know, it's our company is all in the office in Fort Worth. I've worked remote for many, many years, so I, I do both, um, but I'm, I'm a rarity at our office. Um, and I spoke to him, you know, how is it like to him have everybody go remote? remote and he's really engaged social media. He loves Zoom environments like this. In fact, he's been pushing me on it because we have a company meeting every Monday now. They make it fun. Like we've had Funny Hair Day and we've had something um, College Day, all these things that get the employees, you know, uplifted at the beginning of the week. Um, but he said it's so important to see their faces. You know, because he's used to seeing people in person. And so what he, what he loves, he encourages the video, which what you're using, um, on this so we can see each other. So you can see how they're, if they're working, they're more engaged. You know that they're not multitasking when they're on the meeting, if you can see their face, and they're less likely to. So that's a tip from our own manager. And, and same thing, keep the, the same goals that you have in the office um, remote, uh, just have a different way of potentially tracking them. Um, so Mike, do you want to start off with returning employees to work? So we're reopening Texas uh, step by step, and um, the uh, employers, as you call back these folks that we've either furloughed or laid off, first question is, did you furlough them or did you lay them off? Uh, furlough is not really a legal term, but what it really means is that we've kept them on our payroll. We're just not paying them. We're not scheduling them, and they're not, we're not paying them, but they've probably continued benefits through all of this time. And so those employees, that's pretty easy. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the communication to them and all that, but they're coming in, you know, just like they were on vacation before and they're coming in. But those that we laid off, we actually terminated their employment. Uh, we need to reevaluate what we need to do paperwork wise as we bring them back in. Um, if, uh, for instance, if it's been, I think, more than three years since they completed their I-9, we may need a new I-9 on them or have them, or the employer may need to complete section three of the I-9 uh, as a rehire. So those are things that we've got to think through. Uh, we've got to make decisions about, do we need a new W-2? Is it up to date? Uh, or is it over, I think, three years old as well? So, and then we need to talk to our benefits brokers. Do I have to re-enroll these people in, in benefits or can we just take what, they're, what they were doing before and all that, because they're, these are really, Rehires are basically new employees and we're going to, have to go through all that process and then you need to examine your policies. What do we require of them when, when it's a rehire? We give them a, um, an employee handbook and they sign an acknowledgement that they've read it and they understand it and all of those kind of new hire paperwork issues. We probably, just to be safe, want to go through with these new employees uh, or these rehired employees. But then, so let's say we've got 50 employees that we uh, uh, furloughed or laid off, 
and now we want to bring some of them back, but not all of them. We don't have enough work. Uh, we're, with social distancing, we don't want them uh, desk to desk like they were before, maybe. So who are we going to bring back? Well, the first thing, and, and our instinct as employers who want to take care of our employees and keep them safe is, well, you know, Margaret is 65 and she's got respiratory problems. So I don't, I want to keep her at home. I don't want her to, I don't want to bring her back in the office. And that you have every good intention for that. And it's a horrible idea. Okay. Um, you really uh, do not want to make health decisions uh, based on just perceptions of risk or hiring decisions based on perception of risk uh, of health risk. If they can do the job and they don't present uh, a threat to other employees, you, you kind of need to let them make the decisions about the risk they're willing to take. Um, so we start, we have objective criteria, not that kind of criteria, but criteria that goes to, okay, we need five analysts. We don't need all 20 analysts. So let's look at the, who are, what's our, what are our criteria for bringing out an analyst? And if, and you know, in this ideal world, all of our analysts perform at the exact same high level, and we could just take the five with the most seniority and bring them back. But in reality, we know who our five best are. We know who they're who have the most competencies in different areas and who uh, can produce the most work. And so we document, find a way to document that. And if you've been a good manager for the, you know, the previous five years, you've gotten good documentation of performance. You know, you can, you can look to uh, your numbers and, and point out, here are the people who perform at the highest levels. And this is why I'm going to bring them back. It makes it really easy to defend it if it's ever challenged. But you don't want to do it based on age. You don't want to do it on any perceived disability or anything like that. Um, and then once you've made that criteria, we need to start reaching out to those employees we want to bring back. And we want, you need to say, hey, you know, we're a phase one or a phase two employer, and we're going to reopen the office. We're going to start bringing people back in. But then the employee may say, I don't feel comfortable returning. Okay, well, you know, our, our gut early in this process for employers who, you know, were essential businesses and didn't close, a lot of folks said, well, I understand that. Go ahead and work remote or don't work, you know, we'll just, we'll just we'll, you know, uh, furlough you. But the reality is there may not be a business reason to continue doing that. And so what we need to really engage in is an interactive process with this employee to understand why they don't feel comfortable coming back. It could be that they just really like working from home and that's just what they want to do now. Or it could be they have some le legitimate concerns, maybe something that triggers, triggered, uh, will trigger an FFCRA extended FMLA issue, or maybe it's just, they just say, you know, this has all been so traumatic for me. I just, just think I can't even go to the grocery store. The risk of, the, of going out, it just causes me too much stress. Well, as soon as they say that, you may have an Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, issue. I mean, if you're perceiving them as this, you know, as having PTSD or some sort of distress, I think a lot of employers are going to have to make decisions about that. And you, so you're going to have to in, engage in that interactive process. Um, and if you decide to be the heavy and lay it down on your employees that, hey, we're making you this offer to return to work one time. If you don't take it, we're going to uh, remove you from payroll. Or we're not going to call you back. We're going to hire, you know, just go to the next employee and then hire new people. You got to think about what that's going to do for morale for those employees who are left behind, and you risk starting uh, conversations that turn into concerted effort and turn into uh, the the risk of of a union getting involved. Um, and in Texas, we think, ah, oh, you can't get a union. We're you know blah blah. We're working right right to work state, all that. You can get one real quick, and the employers who get them are usually the employers who deserve them. And if, if, you're not, if you're not hearing your employees, listening to them, having open and honest communications with them, you could end up with those problems. So the best advice I've heard so far is be patient with folks who are really concerned about coming back into the office, work out, uh, you know, if they indicate any kind of medical issue or just even emotional issue around it, um, enter into the ADA interactive process. Maybe they need to go see a doctor. Maybe they need to have a doctor give you some feedback about their ability to do this job and you enter into that process. Um, but what you don't want to do is be cavalier about it. I think just that you don't want to uh, have any bright line rules that you follow because 
every employee situation is going to be different and they will remember how you make them feel in six months and in two years even if they're still there and they're productive they're not going to be as engaged if they feel like you demonstrated a lack of caring for them uh when you know during you know this is obviously a challenging time for a lot of folks um so they're walking in the office on day one what are we going to do or, you know and let's say we've got half our employees coming back on day one um i'm a little nervous about coming in do i really want to sit in the common area break room and have coffee with everybody or we even have break rooms open what you know so we need to come up with what our policies are going to be to keep everybody healthy the governor's uh guidelines that were published uh late last week i guess about reopening texas has a whole series of recommendations for employers and employees on being safe and in return to work uh, you definitely need policies in place and everybody needs to have them. And I even recommend having everybody sign them, that they, you know, they acknowledging that they've received them and understand them, that if they have any of the, I think there's 11 symptoms in the governor's document that if they have any of those symptoms, you know what, we need you not to come to work if you have those symptoms. And then it escalates. If you've been exposed, you know, you've been exposed or suspect you've been, uh, exposed to COVID-19 or, you know, you're diagnosed with COVID-19. In those cases, we need to have a, a, you know, there's, we may need you to self isolate for at least two weeks or get some sort of clearance before you return to work. A lot of employers are going to be doing questionnaires either on a weekly or a daily basis uh, that say, have you had any of these 11 symptoms? Have you been exposed? Just to get, just so you've got documentation in your file that you as an employer were doing what you could reasonably do to ensure that employees were complying with uh, with your policies. Some employers are going to start doing temperature checks with uh, the touchless uh, electronic thermometers. And uh, that's the EOC has come out and said that's fine, which was something you probably couldn't have done before all of this. But uh, you do have a responsibility as an employer to, to ensure that it's a safe workplace for everybody else. And so uh, we're going to see a lot of employers doing that. But even your policy needs to say, What's that cutoff? Is it 100.3, which is what a lot of the experts are calling a, a temperature now? But so it doesn't mean if I'm 100, you're going to let me come to work. But if I'm 100.3, I can't. But, you know, those kind of questions. And who's going to take that and who's going to have that information? Because um, this is, you know, potentially HIPAA covered information. And so what are we going to do with that information? Is HR going to be taking people's temperatures? Or are you just going to have the receptionist doing it? And where's that information going? Whoever, whoever's handling it needs to be trained to protect the information. And then some employers have talked about antibodies tests, and most of those are, are pinprick tests uh, to see if somebody's got the antibodies uh, for COVID. If you're going to do that, that is probably, unless you've got an employee health nurse or somebody really trained appropriately to do that, that's a, that's a situation where you want somebody outside doing it. And then how often are you going to do it? If you do it once a week, is that safe enough? Um, or do you need to do it twice a week, every day? What, what's your plan for, for doing those kinds of things? And of course, the big issue is face masks, um, especially if we're in a tighter work area where there's a lot of common area where we have to go to meetings. Are we going to require employees to wear face masks? Probably not a horrible idea, but you're going to have employees who don't like to do it. And again, when they object to it, go through an interactive process so you understand why, because there may, there's all kinds of religions out there and all kinds of things. There could be a religious reason somebody doesn't want to wear a face mask or, uh, you know, they've got some truly ethical reason that they're, they're opposed to it. And uh, so you've got to enter into those conversations so you understand and then you can make individual decisions. And of course, we want social distancing and everybody should have a, a gallon of sanitizer on their desk and at every door, doorway at our offices before we shut them down. We had it on both sides of every door. So with a sign saying, you know, uh, please sanitize before you touch the doorknob. And I think a lot of people are going to go to motion sensitive doors and things like that that unlock and you can open with your elbow without having to uh, even uh, touch a doorknob. But the big thing is, as we make all these changes, we've got to communicate it really well with our employees so that they feel like we, we talked to them and we heard them and, uh, and respond responded to their their concerns along along the way um, 
And then if you're dealing with customers and the public's coming in, you got a whole other set of issues. Uh, the governor's uh, guidelines suggested that you have certain times for high risk uh, customers. If there's, you know, if you've got customers coming in, and you may want to uh, be sure you're, you're staffed so that if, you know, certainly I see it in grocery stores, but um, you're staffed sufficiently so that you can get those high risk customers in and out of your store quickly. Um, but you may have people coming in for meetings and things like that. So there need to be protocols in place for how we clean a conference room after a meeting um, uh -huh. and where we allow people, you know, because you may not be requiring all of your visitors. You're not going to require the FedEx guy to take his temperature every time he walks in the room. But if you can reduce the number of places that customers or visit, visitors touch or have come in contact with, it makes it easier to maintain the, the, uh, the cleanliness. Maybe even look at contactless payment and those kinds of things so that you don't have to uh, handle somebody else's credit cards or have those common swipe machines that everybody touches and pushes into keypads and stuff. Um, Jen, you want to talk about uh, the positive and sick, COVID positive and sick employees and the CDC's guidelines? Yeah, I just sure. want to be sure. conscious. Um, we, we want to try to keep these to about 30 minutes or so. So um, I do have a few questions here. So um, if it's right with y'all, I may just sure. go ahead and start asking some of these sure. questions to get some uh, feedback. So um, really good point about social distancing and policies and procedures in place. Um, one of the questions is, you know, am I allowed to uh, write up somebody uh, in discipline for um, not obeying the social distancing guidelines? Uh, yes, but let me suggest you're starting way late in that process. That question starts really late in, in a process. And before you uh, start thinking about writing people up and all of that, I think it's, it goes back to communication, having conversations with the employees. These are the reasons that we want you to do this. And, um, and there are, I've got a number of them, friend, you know, friends who uh, are convinced that this thing is just short of a hoax, right? And that it's not a risk and I'm not worried about it. And, uh, you know, this is uh, a right wing conspiracy or a left wing conspiracy. And so you may see some of that in your, in your workplace. So the answer there is, well, you know, what we want you to do is we want everybody else to be comfortable working with you. And so your job as an employee is to be accessible and part of the team and make everyone feel comfortable and function as a team. So we need you to respect this policy. Most of your employees are going to do it. And the ones who, uh, who don't, yeah, you may have to follow your own, whether it's progressive discipline or whatever other your own policies are around how you address those issues. Uh, but, um, you know, if somebody is going around licking other people's keyboards or something, you know, just, uh, you know, that's, you know, those, you'll address those issues. But most of our employees, if we treat them like adults, we'll, we'll act like adults. And hopefully it won't be too much of an issue. But yes, you, you can apply, you know, uh, the policies in order to keep the other employees safe. Well, there goes my uh, strategy of licking people's keyboards now. It's yeah. a big practice I did before COVID, and so now I'm um, yeah, All of this is really interesting because um, there, be, there does become sort of a, you know, civil liberty, freedom, we're Texan, mm -hmm. we're American. We're Texans, pew, yeah. pew, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and don't, you, you can't tell me what to do. Right. Um, but when it comes to health and wellness and those types of things, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a real deal. And um, walking that line is, is going to be challenging. And, and as you all were alluding to, there's, there's just, there's a lot more questions than there are answers right now, which is um, why I'm glad that the governor and the state in general is, 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 is having a slow ramped up process to, to provide more guidance for us. Yeah. And the bottom line is, I mean, we can tell you what to do. I mean, if we're the employer, we can tell you what to do. I mean, you know, we, we've got a lot of latitude, especially in a state, in a right to work state like Texas, but the bottom line is we don't want to do that. You know, let's, let's not play that card. Let's, let's work with our employees. Most of them are reasonable. And if we treat them like adults, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, we'll all be a lot more successful at, at the end of the day. Super. 
Well, Mike and Jen, thank you so much for being um, our speakers today for Leaders Online. Really appreciate it. I got a couple text messages as, as we were going, just saying how insightful your approach is. And, and uh, y'all just, y'all present it in a way that's really easy to understand. Um, and, and the theme, I think, for me is just the importance of, of, of sitting down with people and having discussions and setting up expectations um, doing so initially um, to, to be able to get people's um, buy-in and understanding and support. So um, thanks so much. Um, for those that, that are still here, a um, couple of announcements I wanted to make. So tomorrow at 10 a.m., um, we're going to have our um, uh, LinkedIn page office hours. So if you go into our LinkedIn site, uh, we have a live forum where experts will be on hand to answer your questions. We'll be talking about forward thinking, developing your business in a post-COVID-19 economy. Um, also wanted to say, uh, if you uh, haven't seen, we um, sent out a press release um, that we at the Chamber have partnered with the Hispanic Chamber and the Metropolitan Black Chamber, Visit Fort Worth and the City of Fort Worth's Economic Development Department to offer a PPE. Um, for businesses, specifically um, focusing on those businesses um, initially that are going to be reopening tomorrow. Um, so there's a link in our website for those businesses that are interested. This is uh, sponsored by, uh, in partnership with Facebook, um, who's allowing us to do this, um, to be able to, to, um, to give out free PPE on a limited uh, supply for, for those businesses. So go to our website for more details. So Thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, Mike, Jen, thanks for being here, and you all have a fabulous Thursday. Thanks yeah, for having thank us. You. Bye.